Hello, hola a todos. My name is Taryn Odom and I am currently a Spanish teacher for NCBPS, the North Carolina Virtual Public School. And um, I'm actually excited about this topic because I am somewhat of a nerd when it comes to um, curriculum design and assessment for world languages online. And so I'm thrilled to be able to speak with you and I only have 30 minutes. So I'm gonna give you a very broad perspective of some of the best practices that I have encountered and adopted um, or we have adopted as well as some challenges that are faced in the realm of online world language learning. So first we're going to start out with talking about just best practices and through experience. Uh, I, I love this graphic because I think oftentimes we focus on formative and summative and I, I'm not here to explain in great detail what formative and summative are because I'm sure that all of us in the room have seen this a million times, but I did want to um, just touch on the importance of self-assessment as a part of the assessment process uh, because self-assessment obviously can be a uh, form of formative assessment um, but I, I like to include it as a separate criteria uh, for a few different reasons and this graphic I really like um, because all of these categories that are included here on uh, what they uh, would almost say as a continuum are extremely important in the assessment process um, or common in the, and um, some of them are probably hot topic discussions or debatable especially in regards to world languages like standardized tests uh, but I'm going to focus on self-assessment portfolios and rubrics quite a bit in and what I have to say so I love this um, kind of picture it gives you an accurate kind of real world depiction of assessment. So when a chef tastes the soup, that's self-assessment, right? To see how, uh, you know, see how she, <laughs> how she did. And so she knows what to add or, or um, you know, to make the soup taste a little bit better. When the kitchen staff tastes the soup, that's formative assessment, right? So it's not judgmental or whatever, it's still practice. You still have time to refine or improve the soup. Um, but when this customer finally ends up tasting the soup, that's summative assessment. That's when the rubber hits the road, if you will, and that's gonna be the deal breaker of whether, um, you know, students are able to, to really show what they know and have learned and can do which of course is our um, main goal. One of my biggest philosophies in regards to assessment, not even online, but in, if, in whatever environment, whether it's face-to-face, um, -face, hybrid blended format, or all online, the purpose and function of assessment is, is very important. And oftentimes as teachers, and I myself was guilty of it, uh, first starting out as a teacher, I'm sure all of us at some point or time, um, you know, didn't know this or didn't follow this mantra, if you will, but the mantra being assess what you teach and teach what you assess, and then assess how you teach and teach how you assess. And you might have to read that a few times and let it sink in and think about what you do in the classroom. But basically, in a nutshell, that's saying that whatever you do to assess a student should be representative of what you do in the classroom every single day, whether that is a face-to-face -face classroom, like I said, or whether it's an online classroom or a hybrid format it should be the exact same uh, or pretty much very similar to what the students are already doing. So if you don't give tests throughout your, uh, your class and then you're testing them at the end, that, that's not um, an accurate and efficient representation of what they know and can do um, because that's not what they're used to. So not only just in format, whether it's tests versus portfolio versus, you know, project based or whatever it might be, um, as well as content. So, I mean, that one goes almost as common sense, but if, if you don't teach it, then you cannot, um, well, <laughs> I guess you technically could, but not with great um, expectations that you would be able to assess uh, what you are teaching. And the same thing with how. So the content and the delivery method need to match what is done every day um, in the classroom. Again, wherever that classroom may be or whatever that classroom may look like. So for me, um, there's been this adoption process of IPAs. IPAs being integrated performance assessments. And I would uh, be so bold to say that 
the IAPAs have truly become the gold standard in world language teaching. Again, not even just online. Um, it's applicable to any learning environment and delivery method, but um, the integrated performance assessment allows you to do what we just talked about to where um, you have real world type tasks that students have to complete that are integrated in, in the aspect that they have a, a representation of the interpretive, the interpersonal, and the presentational modes of communication. Uh, and it's important, I think, I, let's see if we can do, with the interpretive for students to have the opportunity to listen to or view um, authentic text uh, to, and to answer information on that and of course for the teacher to be able to provide feedback with that and with the interpersonal communication for students to engage in conversation about whatever topic is at hand and um, and that is of course relates to that specific text that interpretive text that was provided and then uh, usually as uh, as a third part there is some presentational piece where students can engage in the content and they can create and truly show off what they know through sharing um, what they've learned they can do speeches or skits videos um, podcasts posters all, all kinds of stuff right um, but the the important thing to focus on is that it's including as many of the language domains as possible. And I love this quote because, um, again, looking at kind of the traditional way of assessment, like when I took world language classes of, um, you know, kind of sit and get and very grammar-based instruction, uh, very much grammar-based instruction, and then the assessment was reflective of that as well. Um, the assessments that I took as a world language student uh, did not, you know, accurately prepare me for the actual world of communication. Uh, you know, how to fill in a chart of conjugations while helpful and can be a part of the learning process, uh, obviously is not something that if you're on the side of the road in Mexico, somebody's going to ask you to do, <laughs> right? So um, I love this quote because of that, because there is a huge difference uh, between school and life. And I think as teachers, as effective teachers, we want to try to make this um, one and the same or that there's not as stark a delineation between school and life um, as in this quote. So I, I find that that is a, a great challenge to do because uh, to a certain degree it is not natural unless you are in a an immersive setting in the target culture and with the target language, then you're going to have a degree of um, forced uh, instruction, but you can remove and try to improve uh, your instruction as much as possible to make it so that it uh, is applicable and integrates all of the different or as many different domains as possible and um, so that your, your students can have that uh, real world task at hand. Uh, so e-lingual folio is one of the pieces that I wanted to speak about uh, in kind of great detail. And I don't know uh, if anybody has had experience with e-lingual folio. I'd love for you to type in the chat box if you have. Um, it might not have been e-lingual folio, but it might have been the, prior to e-lingual folio, there was lingual folio. But um, e-lingual folio, lingual folio, whichever you want to look at, one's just digital, one's paper-based. It started out obviously as paper-based. It's a language portfolio. And in this language portfolio, students uh, are completely in charge of the lingual folio, the language portfolio themselves. So it's something that is uh, theirs personally. They own it. They uh, Everything that they do is for uh, their own portfolio and they keep it and can take it wherever they would like. Um, and they use it in each and every course in a language that they um, that they pursue. So, um, you know, our goal is obviously so that they would attend and go through many levels of language, but even if it's just two levels, they would start it in level one of the language, and then they would keep that same lingual folio, e-lingual folio, and into level two and pick up where they left off. But what's really neat is that this is a self-assessment tool that really allows students to assess their own learning. And since they're kind of put in the driver's seat, if you will, that they're having to you know, think about their own learning. So this concept of metacognition, whereas 
you know, I'm taking responsibility. I'm being held accountable for my own learning. I need to know what do I know? What am I working on? And if I'm working on it, you know, what do I need to do to get to that next level? And so that is, you know, basically the encompassing um, purpose of the e-lingual folio is for students to keep track of that so that they can constantly be aware of where they are and uh, know exactly what they need to improve uh, their proficiency. There are unique parts to the e-lingual folio uh, that are, you know, what I just spoke about is in reference to the proficiency grids and specific, uh, specifically the I can statements, but there are also, we have to keep in mind also, um, we know that learning does not always take place within four walls. So language instruction could be as, you know, day to day as going to a, a restaurant and interacting with a waiter or waitress in the target language. It could be traveling to a, um, a, a different country. It could be viewing a foreign film. So there are all of these other learning tasks and experiences and encounters that students uh, come into contact with on a daily basis that are, are not, is learning taking place out of four walls. It's not, um, you know, the traditional uh, education and the way we've thought about school. And so as language teachers, we have to recognize that and we want the students to recognize that as well so that they can know and understand that learning does not stop and that there are all of these wonderful ways to, especially with language, to learn language and to be uh, immersed into the culture because we know that learning language without culture is, is, uh, <laughs> an exercise in futility. You can't truly grasp the idea of a language without knowing the lens through which it is spoken. And so with this e-lingual folio, they, they have those same learning encounters and experiences that they can log. They also are walked through the process of metacognition as far as uh, thinking about how they learn in general, as well as how they learn a language. And then the um, the cherry on top is what you see at the bottom of the dossier uh, would be their evidences. And this is the piece that's really can be very telling and very beneficial for students, especially if the, the more levels that they take and the more experiences they have, they can take this language portfolio and show it off to potential schools or employers or whomever to show exactly say, you know, I am, um, I have this proficiency level and here is why and here's some of my work. So being able to show um, truly what they can do um, is very powerful. It's instead of just having a proficiency level on a resume, uh, you know, this would be much more um, meaningful and, and well received from a potential employer, for example. So um, I'm not going to spend too, too much time on, but I did want to touch on that about the importance of self-assessment in learning a language because we know that, you know, the confidence and, um, you know, understanding of how students learn is a big piece of being successful in a world language. So um, we want to make sure that they have all the tools at their disposal to do that. And once they are walked through the process and they understand, then usually they take off. And, um, you know, those who understand the process uh, really find a lot of value in it, as well as with the teachers. Uh, this specifically, the teachers can see where the students rate themselves. So even though the students are responsible for it and uh, complete it, the teachers um, use it to inform their instruction as well, which is very powerful because you might have something uh, in your mind as a teacher as far as where the student is in each domain uh, in regards to proficiency level, but that might vary greatly than what is exhibited in the e-lingual folio. And it could be um, that the student rates himself much higher or lower, but regardless, that's, a, that's an important conversation to have that student to figure out why there's a discrepancy and, and um, to discuss, you know, what that, where that student is and how to move to the next level. So um, even just from that conversation is, is very powerful. So I see a, a question, I think somebody addressed it, but I, I don't know if you want me to answer it or I'll move on. Um, but the e-lingual folio specifically that I'm referencing is something that North Carolina specifically 
designed from the lingua folio and the lingua folio was not um, just from North Carolina there I think Kentucky has one and I, I want to say Oregon there's somewhere out, out west Oregon or Colorado that also has or maybe Minnesota um, that also has a, a similar lingua folio but what we did is we digitized it so we uh, papers are great but it's nice to be able to have a, an electronic portfolio um, for students to use it's a lot less papers and eco-friendly but then it also allows them the uh, ability since it's in the cloud to save and to access from anywhere no matter even if they were to switch schools for example or to move to a different state that they would still have that available and, and wouldn't have to worry about keeping up with papers Oregon that's what it was thank you Emily I knew it was somewhere it was um, so when students create their e-lingual folio account they only do it once once their accounts created um, it's done and they share those portfolios with their teachers so that the teachers can see them um, and it's very similar in terminology and in regards to like Facebook they add you as a friend and then they have to share their portfolio with you and you can see it but you can't change or modify any, anything so it's purely to inform your instruction and inform your uh, with that student your conversations with that student to improve their instruction and like I said one of my biggest uh, things that I could say positives if you will about the e-learning flow is the fact that it's for the students by the students so there's this true sense of student ownership where the student is driving these things so the student has a plan and shows their intentions there are criteria that are listed within the the e-lingual folio um, that they have to meet and then they um, not only answer questions but come up with questions and then receive feedback from their instructor so it is a um, you have this cycle of feedback that does exist but ultimately the student is assessing him or herself uh, which is very very powerful yes and I'll give my email in case anybody has further questions I'll be happy to explain it and like I said, I only have 10 more minutes. So I'm gonna to try to run through this. Um, another in regards to best practice is the use of rubrics. So uh, again, rubrics, the idea of rubrics are, is probably not new to any of us. Uh, what's interesting is everybody has a way of doing rubrics and there is not really, I mean, I guess there potentially is a wrong way, but there's just a huge degree of variability in regards to rubrics and quality of rubrics and efficacy of rubrics. So uh, the one that's on this particular screen is not mine. This is from Jefferson County Public Schools in Kentucky. Kentucky has some great world language. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Kentucky program curriculums. Um, they have a great wealth of resources in Kentucky and some um, especially in regards to world language. This pr specific rubric is in regards to performance. Um, and so if you look at the individual categories, this is not necessarily um, for a writing assignment. So it's important to think about what task you are using, but um, it needs to be specific to what you're doing and serve the purpose for what you are trying to do. So um, while here the categories are actually show the proficiency levels, we know that a student in level one, um, their rubric is gonna need to look a little bit different. It needs to, um, and if it's for an assignment, needs to be task-based. So there are different ways of categorizing rubrics. You have, um, you know, holistic rubrics, anal analytical rubrics, um, you know, different different ways of looking at them. But ultimately, the importance of rubrics is what is basically our mission in, in education, right? What should students know how to do, uh, and how do we know when they know it and when they can do it? Right, so that is the, the question that we're, we as educators are always trying to answer. That's great, right? We, we need to know, we need to teach the content, we need to know what they need to know, and we need to know when they do know it. And so by having rubrics in place, uh, this uh, allows you to quantify, uh, it does take a little time on the front end, obviously for the design of the rubrics, um, but once you have them set, you might tweak them or uh, use it as a template for another assignment but it, 
it's just a lot of work on the front end, but after that, it's, it's not too bad. But with the rubrics, you are removing the subjectivity that is so common and can or can be so common in world languages and it increases the objectivity uh, in assessing students. So it increases the objectivity, increases transparency in what you are doing. It's helpful for parents, obviously, or school leaders to see how you're assessing students and how a grade, uh, how you come to getting a grade for a student. And it fosters trust and understanding between the teacher and the student because it decreases the stress on the students because they know exactly what's expected of them because they have the understanding of the expectations whereas if there is no rubric that might not exist they don't know how they're evaluated how they're graded just like when we are evaluated as teachers we want to know how we're evaluated right we should have that same concept in regards to our students our students want to know how they're going to be evaluated what they need to know and how how they're going to be evaluated so it helps students have that understanding and security um, like i said decreasing their stress as a result and just in if you look at it from a design perspective and uh from a and from a student, again, when we plan a lesson, you know, we, we were all probably taught backwards design. You want to create a lesson or a unit with the end in mind because you want to know where you're going. You have to have some kind of map. You have to, you know, need to know your destination and then you need to make a map to get there or directions to get there. So the same thing with the students. They need to know what their outcome or outcomes are going to be and then they need a map on how to get there and this rubric acts as that map. So. Um, and I have great examples I can touch on too. Uh, if you have questions, again, I'll be happy to follow up, but that's a big best practice for me. I will say we use Canvas at NCBPS, and what's wonderful about Canvas is that you can actually integrate rubrics into the assignments. So again, it's a lot of work on the front end of setting up those rubrics, but once they are there, you can use them for subsequent classes. And so it's very easy. If you had your chart, you just click on um, which area the student um, obtained, and then it, it you can choose for it to add it all up for you. I mean, very, very user friendly um, if you use Canvas as an LMS. Moodle also has the use of rubrics. It's not quite as nice as Canvas, um, but it is there depending on which version of Moodle you have. Um, so for any of, the, of you who are using Moodle as well, that is also an option. All right, really quickly. So challenges, and I only have two main challenges, and it's uh, the first one is access and compatibility, which to a large degree sometimes is out of our control, but it's definitely worth mentioning that uh, student access not only to uh, the appropriate technology, just a computer, or mobile device, whatever you use for your course is so important uh, for us as world language teachers, they need to have a way of recording themselves. And so, of course, that has changed through years and what that looks like, because we have a lot of students recording on their phones, uh, which is great, whatever they can and have at their disposable to record on is, is wonderful, but it just needs to be reliable. It needs to be there and it needs to be reliable. Um, and so in addition to that, not only should they have the device, but they need to have the connection, the reliable internet um, to be able to perform what they need. And I think that is something that uh, we struggle with here in North Carolina, we're getting better at because our infrastructure is improving in regards to broadband and things like that, especially more rural parts of the state. But it's worth mentioning that that is gonna still be a a major issue for students, not only in North Carolina, but throughout the United States uh, or the world, <laughs> for sure, um, and making sure that they have the devices, but they also have the connectivity um, that they need. And um, lastly, in regards to access, it's worth mentioning that uh, students need to have the time commitment, the hours of use with those devices. So if they're using an internet cafe or a library um, or even a class at the, the time of um, hours of use it needs to factor into um, their assessment and, and ultimately the instruction um, altogether. Compatibility is a big issue, obviously, in online learning, not just world languages. And this is all, again, highly variable based on the specific learning management system that is used, what browser is used with that learning LMS, and then any Web 2.0 tools that are used. And there's just this, always this ongoing 
issue of compatibility that we as online teachers uh, are confronted with and that we just have to I always say kind of jump through the hoops we have to figure out what works at any given point in time uh, you know one browser for example with Moodle Mozilla Firefox used to work best but now we were in Canvas so Google Chrome works the best and then browsers change too so who's not to say in five years there's this wonderful new browser on the same that uh, works even better so uh, we just have to constantly be able to learn and adapt be flexible with our teaching and be understanding with our students when issues arise um, to help them troubleshoot because ultimately we don't want access or compatibility issues to keep them from learning a language because that would be like the worst case scenario and that is something that does happen um, that we are constantly again trying to prevent from happening or, or uh, mediate um, because we want the students to have as a positive and successful experience as possible. Lastly, as uh, world language teachers, authenticity of our assessments and even uh, materials for our instruction is always a challenge. And <laughs> When I was in school and, and, and took a word language as um, I took Spanish as a second language, and so I remember having a few authentic resources, some advertisements and things like that, but for the majority, it was very scripted world language instruction and I mean granted, you can still learn from scripted world language instruction, but um, it's not going to be as reflective again of the real world as if you were to use authentic text uh, and the struggle not only to find authentic text is is a challenge for us and um, and this could be different for you but our big issue is the terms of use and copyright uh, infringement so there's been a big push uh, and depending on with whom you teach or at your environment uh, you might have a little more leeway but for us we had to find unique ways of finding and integrating resources that did not compromise our um, the licensing and the purpose for which we we're trying to do because when we designed the courses we wanted uh, we had to do so uh, keeping in mind that they may be sold later um, and so as such we can't use things that are not uh, license for uh, modification or reuse or for commercial purposes so that cuts out a lot of resources that uh, might use otherwise and so um, if that is the f the case that where you might teach um, I encourage you to think of unique ways in having students kind of take on the role of researching and finding resources maybe maybe offering suggestions to go out and seek so for example in the school we have students go and look at different websites for schools in Spain to see uh, to learn about the school system and to pretend that they are a student in Spain going to the school uh, and so I encourage you to think of those kind of workarounds if you will if you are faced with that situation but obviously the more authentic text that you can integrate into your instruction and of course with your assessments uh, the better off your students will be so that's the the main things and I went one minute over <laughs> sorry I felt like I was flying through that um, but here is my email and my Twitter handle if you have any questions I'll be happy and of course after uh, Elizabeth speaks we will both be around on hand to answer any questions that you might have as well hi there I am Elizabeth lovely Alfonso and I have been a French teacher for over 20 years um, I have been an online French teacher for close to 12 to 14 and with North Carolina virtual school for nine years now, going on the 10-year anniversary, yes. And just for fun, I go in and out of the classroom because I love face-to-face -face teaching still as an adjunct professor at the University of South Florida, St. Pete campus. I am, I, I consider myself not at all a scholar or a researcher on this subject at all, but I am a great practitioner of the applied research theories <laughs> and knowledge of all which we've been degreed for and pretty much practice in our classrooms on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is gonna be my presentation for you of pretty much boots on the ground, uh, ground zero, my from the field experiences of challenges in online assessment. And you'll see it coupled a bit um, with um, online learning as well, but they kind of go hand in hand because like Taryn was mentioning earlier, mentioning earlier, especially when we're in the face-to-face -face classroom, and that is one of the challenges being online, 
is I feel like I'm constantly assessing my students and constantly assessing my teacher, my teaching. And I'm constantly either giving them indirect or direct feedback because that's how we bounce off of one another. So starting with challenge numero un, the elephant in the room, right, would be <laughs> the elephant in the room would, of course, be as like Taryn touched on assessments and technology. The students use different software types of computers and browsers, and this can inhibit ease of accessing course content. And you can see the picture above. You can see Taryn and I also, as a contemporary, we have great choice in images that catch our eyes. We've used the similar, the same image. But I have um, added a little picture up in that first laptop that shows a bunch of students looking at a hurdle. And he says, welcome to the hurdle team. Because the first hurdle, the students have to actually get over an online world, including online assessments, is the technology. And then we can get to the language. Um, so unfortunately, we do have to spend a little bit more prep time in the beginning with the technology. And as you can see by the bottom image, um, he's successfully going over the hurdle. Um, another frustration that happens with students is the media is not working for them sometimes, or their school, it's not supported by their schools, or as Taryn touched on, they all have different types of computers, and over the years, the browsers become stronger or weaker, and we all have to choose the new browser that corresponds well um, with the content in the online course that you're teaching. So this can sometimes also affect uh, the speaking assignments as well, um, when students are either having to listen to audio or when they're having to submit speaking themselves. And I'm gonna share with you later these best practices to overcome these hurdles, these challenges. Um, and then also we offer live classes and I get emails all the time, I can't get in a live class. So sometimes it's an individual practice of working with the students to find out what exactly they need. But just focusing on the challenges, for a few minutes and then also with the schools. Um, this is mostly K through 12, of course, any higher education online learning would happen um, on, on, in their own locations, but it could still happen. Wi-Fi issues, limited time. If they don't have computers at home, they're limited by the time in their schools. Uh, website constraints, their schools have a lot of privacy blocks on them. So we have to ensure that every link that we use, at least in the course content, is something that schools can access with no problem. And anything additional we use, uh, additional materials we use for students, we have to, we can't usually give them points for because if we know that not everybody will be able to access that site. So in K through 12 world at least, we make sure that those sites are accessible from schools. Um, distractions, distractions, now they're in, yes, they're online and they're focusing on their laptops um, in the classroom and during their tests, but now they have different distractions. Um, somebody might sneeze or there's a fire drill or all sorts of interesting things can happen while they're being assessed in their online world. And then sometimes laziness, they feel like they have a lack of support. They all of a sudden go, I don't have a teacher and I have to reassure them over and over, I am your teacher. I'm here for you, no worries. And then sometimes when they get lazy and they don't go through the course content correctly and then they have to have an assessment, sometimes they go, well, I'll just translate it online. That's not an option. A translation of the language doesn't exist. There is no translation between two languages, only interpretations. We use these words to say one thing in the L1 and we use these words to express the same thing in the L2. So we always have to kind of watch out for that as a, as a premier challenge. And because of these issues, that can raise a student's affective filter. And as Taryn touched on, um, and in most of our <clears throat> educational education in the past, we know that that can inhibit that second language acquisition and their memory and their performance. So we really have to be careful that in these online frustrations that we keep their affective filter down to a minimum, if not non-existent, they feel supported so we don't have any of these challenges. The second challenge that I have found in my 12 to 14 years of online teaching has been the limited, the less use of the target language that I was used to using in face-to-face. -face. I was one of those teachers who face-to-face, -face, I walked in for the first the very first day of class, the very first half hour was all in French is the language I teach. And it was easy to do because they could see my actions, they could see my smile. I walked around the room, I shook hands, I introduced myself all in French, I asked them their names, and by modeling, they were able to tell me their names back. Even if they didn't understand what I was saying in French, we learned our ABCs, we learned how to spell their names. All of this was done in the target language. So when we look at the online classroom now, because of the hurdles that we talked about earlier, there might be less use of the L2 overall to first overcome technology challenges. And then two, what ends up happening is you use English more for clarity of directions on the assessments. So now, instead of my students, instead of saying répondez à la question in French, in the beginning, I'm putting everything in English so there's to keep their affective filters lowered. So there's a clarity of the directions and the content. Um, we're having to sometimes, depending on which school you work for, there's not as much of the target language used as I know to be a better um, 
goal towards fluency. Um, and I'd rather, the, the hurdle that I had to overcome as a teacher was um, I was no longer allowed, um, not allowed, I just wasn't, there was no use in me using physical actions and activities to reinforce meaning in the L2. Um, so an example, since they are not hearing French taught in French, uh, there may be a delay to feel at ease and reproduce the LT. So that is with my goal being fluency. And that is also really starting with the novice level. For the, um, the intermediate and the advanced levels, you can probably start with a lot more of the target language from the get-go. But for the novice and the beginning level, there's just a lot more English than I would have preferred. Also, instead of having this environment of a classroom where there's language clues, cues and clues, I meant to write cues, but I wrote clues, isn't that funny? Um, that they can actually use during their assessments. Like say they get nervous and they forgot a word, they can look around the classroom and there's normally French words all over the wall. No longer do they have these cues and clues to help them in the class, in, in the language context that we used to use. And that was difficult and a challenge for me as a teacher of how can I get my students still immersed in the target language while also uh, overcoming some of these challenges. And you'll notice that these are kind of intertwined with the five C's of community culture, communication, comparison, and communities. Not all of them are, but um, it was very important to me to continue to maintain that in the online classroom as I assess them. And it actually makes them easier to assess if you can keep them as immersed as possible. So in looking at challenges from assessments and connection and interaction, now I have less prior knowledge of the student because I'm no longer having that face-to-face um, interaction with them to get to know them. Um, it appears more distant and online exposure versus experienced cultural norms in the classroom via the teacher's behavior and daily events. So say there was a fire drill in the online classroom, we could use that to our opportunity, in fact, and they could learn what's, what's a fire drill called in France? Do they have them in France? So we kind of miss out on those opportunities. Um, they can no longer see body language, facial expressions, natural speech patterns, utterances, emotion, or gestures, except on media, since we're in the online classroom. So there's a less personal use of negotiation and meaning reinforced with action. So for instance, if I am uh, doing a one-on-one -on -one oral interview with a student and I'm assessing them in an oral interview, um, something that they've been prepared for, they've had time to practice, and it supports the content that they have currently been learning, they are face-to-face -face with me and they can see the look on my face. <laughs> they can see whether I smiled or frowned. I can physically move around. Um, they start negotiating meaning with me by not maybe saying exactly the robotic sentence they memorized, but more so the negotiative meaning of using the language in a real meaningful fashion. And I physically am able to guide them with that while assessing. Whereas if they are doing an online um, assessment for a speaking interview that they just submit to me as an audio, they're just doing it on their own. They're not, there's not a bouncing off of each other of um, that real life face-to-face -face communication. Also, it's a different shared experience, missed opportunities, maybe less mean meaningful and not shared, not instant to elicit proper usage. Again, when we're in the classroom or when we're assessing, whether it's formative or summative, if they're presenting a project, I can instantly elicit proper usage if it's necessary. I know we don't like to interrupt students when they're presenting, but if there was something that all of a sudden was it really, really needed to be adjusted, like they accidentally said the wrong word or a, a foul meaning, I can elicit that proper usage right then and there. And then there's a lack of the content clues because we're no longer in the classroom environment. So there's no triggers for them like there is in the classroom. So when they're, when they're being assessed either by project or interview or just a regular old assessment test um, that they're writing in that way and they're being assessed, they just they don't have the context clues. So that's always been a challenge as a teacher for me, and it will be a challenge for the student, of how can I give these kids triggers um, when they're getting assessed as well, depending on what the assessment is. The fourth challenge is assessments and assessments, of course. Uh, as we've talked about, I think it was two weeks ago, we had a really nice speaker, I forget her name, pardon me, on um, assessments and feedback. And as we all know, in order for assessments to be sound, they must be free of bias and distortion. Now, the previous three challenges were of their own right caused distortions. If there's technology issues or the student's not feeling connected, um, there's not enough cultural involvement. Um, so there is a kind of a struggle for having valid and reliable uh, way of measuring our students in assessments. So because of all the reasons earlier, we ask ourselves while assessing students, is it reliable, is it valid? Uh, for assessments that happen to be auto-graded, that happens sometimes, we do that for formative assessments, auto-graded, Auto-graded items may be good for quick checks, 
you know, kind of a quick list. Did, did you get that last lesson? Because especially in the novice level, we teach in chunks because we scaffold the students to learn more and more information and become more and more advanced. So we do a lot of quick checks in the auto graded of comprehension. It's limited and not flexible to students' real use of the language for meaning. So as they're learning the content and they're learning the language, um, I, when we go in, we, we have, a, in my organization, we have a lot of auto-graded assessments, but we also go in as teachers, as a responsibility for us to go in and actually just look over real quick to, to make sure what the computer did was right, because so often, sometimes they used an apostrophe instead of an accent, so they, they still accomplished the task, uh, but there was a bit of a typo, or they had a different way of, of saying something that the computer didn't like or they use they put a period or they didn't put the period so so many of these things can be challenges for assessment in the online classroom so it's limited and not flexible to students real use of the language for meaning because again part of secondary language acquisition they go through steps of negotiating the meaning of what they're trying to say based on the words they've used they've learned in the past and i've had full experience of that because i learned french in america and then i moved to france and in doing that, I absolutely learned. It was a very meaningful experience to learn what negotiation of meaning was. But I did get my furniture delivered, <laughs> and I did rent an apartment, and I did get my electricity turned on. But it wasn't because of it wasn't because of exactly what I learned when I was learning French. It was because I took everything I learned in French, and I had to start to learn to negotiate the meaning of the task I wanted to accomplish. Another challenge is less time and or opportunity for group or pair work or peer review. I believe that peer review is such an essential part of uh, practicing language skills um, and either grouping them together or pairing them up. It's not that it's impossible in the online world when assessing students, it's just it's limited. So I'm just going to leave it at that and go on to challenge number five. <laughs> um, assessments and feedback. Uh, again, the speaker a couple weeks ago about feedback. Um, I am a bit of a feedback geek. It is something that's near and dear to my heart that I think became near and dear to my heart when I started teaching online because that's when I was really connecting with the students. I didn't want them to feel bad. I wanted them to know they're making mistakes, that's okay, that's where they're supposed to be as novice learners or even in the AP courses. I make mistakes in English and I'm this many years old. Of course they're gonna make mistakes in French because it's, it, they've only been learning it for a semester or two or three or four years. Um, so in the assessments with the feedback, a lack of variation if auto-graded feedback. So if, uh, if an organization has time to go back and make their auto-graded feedback, um, more meaningful to that specific question, I highly recommend it. It is a time constraint and it is a project that normally is attached with um, monies that need to be paid for a project like that, but I think it makes a difference in creating a more sound course. Auto feedback can be great, except for if all 10 questions have the same auto feedback, then it loses meaning for the student and it, it loses meaning for the, the assessment at hand. Also, no longer instant in-class setting. They have to wait for submitted assignments. So instead of having like an exit ticket uh, and those kinds of assessments that happen in class where I can, I can assess quickly, did they get what we were working on today? Will they continue to grow with that information? Um, now students are waiting 24, hopefully less than 24 hours to see how well they did an assignment and what my feedback to them is. And then the question, how do I know they read it? There's not a check mark that says, oh, they read your feedback. It's only by my constantly reminding them to read the feedback that they actually, um, sometimes they'll ask me, why did I give a low score? And I'll say, did you read the feedback? Take a look at it and, and let me know what you think. And that's, and it's a, it's a lot of work on my end, but I think it's worthwhile because it puts the student in charge of what they're learning instead of them just saying, why is my score so low? And, and me having to hold their hand through it all, I say, take all your feedback and then let me know. They're like, and then typically they, they get back with me and they're like, oh, I see now. Okay, I got it. Or do you have more review for that? Or I don't understand that. Um, can you explain it more? Also, a challenge would be students attempting quizzes and tests before receiving feedback on already submitted assignments. So there is a bit of a jumping ahead. Uh, students are busy. They feel the need to get all their work done, um, even if they're not quite ready. For the next assignment, they go, oh, I just want to finish it because I have homework in my other class tomorrow. Um, so sometimes before, and, it, and it's not on lack of the teacher for trying to grade in a timely manner. It is just the student just trying to get done, which is not the same thing as trying to learn a language effectively. Also, in assessments and feedback, um, in the online assessment world, I feel that um, my grading for heritage speakers should be different than my non-native speakers. And the freedom to do that is a bit different in the online world than in the um, 
face-to-face -face classroom, um, or at least it's not as evident in the online world. So moving on to best practices, because that's what's most important. And just in case you forgot what the challenges were, I did put them in the right-hand corner for you again. So best practice number one, when it concerns assessments of technology. What you wanna have is a collection of instructions for each type of browser for your students, depending on what their issue is with the technology. And that only happens with experience as a teacher. Um, in one organization I work for, we need to make sure that uh, media settings are always enabled, because if they're not, and the students can't see the video presentation, some of the content, or hear some of the audio in the assessments. So we always, we kind of, um, in all my, all, my, all my online teachers will probably agree with me, they have a collection of responses that they share with students depending on what their browser is, <laughs> what steps um, they need to do to fix whatever technology issue they're having. Um, also, I'm a visual learner, which is why I have a lot of pictures on my presentations, screencasts, or any kind of video cast that you can make to support any written instructions for visual learners. So instead of just saying, number one, do this, number two, do this, and number three, do this, I have a little video that says, okay, I'm going to walk you through what you need to click in order to fix what you need to fix, or I want to ensure that you are seeing, this is what you're supposed to see, and I need to make sure you can see this as well. Also, a good practice would be, and a lot of us do this, the organization I work with, we hold live intro classes, where we, much, much like the Zoom classroom, but it's in our LMS, our learning management system, we um, hold live cl intro classes, and we walk, we share our screen, much like I'm doing here, and we walk students through the new online classroom. We want them to get over that hurdle as quickly as possible so we can move on to the language, because we're language teachers, addressing questions and concerns and checking for tech issues. Also, it's important to get to know your students as well as their needs. Do they have limited Wi-Fi issues? Or are they only in class three times a week? Um, these are all important things to know when, it, when taking into account the assessment of these online learners. Um, I put a website up here called www.join.me, and I put it up there because although in my learning management system, um, in both my organizations, we have online classroom, classroom functions, if they're having tech issues, sometimes they're not able to get into these functions and I still need to meet with them live. And you can do that via Skype. You can do it via um, uh, Desire to Learn in your LMS if you can meet them in your LMS. And then just a public general site for getting to meet with a student face-to-face -face would be join.me. And what you do is you set up a meeting and you give them a code and you send them the link and you're like, okay, meet me here because not all schools can download Skype. Excuse me. Are, are sometimes the, the broadband of it is too much and it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work very well on the computers. Join.me for some reason seems to work really well for me if I need to quickly meet a student who I'm not able to meet in my LMS because we like to keep everything within our organization. But for that student who says, I can't even log in <laughs> and I need to show them how to log in, this is a quick fix. So I hopefully, um, I highly recommend that. Our organization also has a virtual support help desk. Uh, so depending on what your organization is, your educational institution, I highly recommend it because we're language teachers and there's other subject matter teachers as well. I'm not, um, I'm not a software person. I'm not an, I'm not an engineer. I'm not, um, I'm not an, uh, a, a technology person in the sense where I can fix everybody's technology. I just have helpful heads to get everybody started. So we do have a virtual support help desk that helps with the schools and with the student to make sure they have everything they need to be successful with the technology part. So then when they have assessments, there's no affective filter stress that happens when they're being assessed. Best practice number two that corresponded with challenge number two of assessments in the target language. What can you do? For me, and this is more geared towards the novice learner because I teach a lot of French 1 and French 2 because I really like to inspire students to love languages. And so I don't like to stress them out. So I try to make them happy as they're learning. So you want to use as much L2 as possible, you know, their second language in interaction with students, even at the novice level. Example, franglais if necessary. So I have students who come into my French 1 course who have never, they might have never ever heard a French word in their whole life. And if they have, they, maybe they heard it used the wrong way or they say it funny and spell it funny and all those things. So what I like to do is I like to start using French with them on a small basis. The obvious is, salut, bonjour. They learn greetings first off anyway. A lot of, uh, a lot of scholars and researchers are not a proponent of what's called interlanguage. And interlanguage is like franglais, spanglish, those kinds of things. Um, it's actually called macaronic languages. And the reason they're not a proponent of it is because they feel like if students are overusing this interlanguage, it may fossilize 
But in my experience, that only happens if the student does not continue to improve in the language. For me, interlanguage is what saved my life overseas because when I couldn't speak fluently in French, I used interlanguage for negotiation of meaning in order to get my needs met. And interlanguage is a savior for me. And I, it's a way to play with the language in a light way because kids actually like using foreign language. They actually like being able to say things funny. That's why they speak pig, pig Latin as children. Um, so I always start with a, with a bonjour. And then they start to write me back, say it's a text. And they'll say, thank you. And I'm like, did you mean merci? And they write me back and they go, merci. And I'm like, exactly. And you just want to get them to use the target language as much as possible. It will, that'll be your formative assessment and it'll help them in general in their summative assessment. Video of common classroom directions and commands in the target language or incorporate it into a lesson at the start. I missed the in-class part where I taught students commands like turn la page, uh, répondez à la question, you know, turn the page, answer this question, répétez après moi, repeat after me. I miss that component in the online world because as I addressed earlier in the challenges, we use so much of English just for clarification and to be concise and so there's no misunderstandings. Also, so their parents can understand what they're supposed to do or their schools can see what they're supposed to do. But for me as a language teacher, it takes away from them actually acquiring the language. But I understand why we do it and I don't mind doing it, but it was a challenge for me. So best practice would be to go ahead and either make a video or in your online um, getting in your online introduction to the course uh, live class. You can also go over these kinds of things and incorporate them into a lesson at the start. Uh, start to scaffold your directions in lessons because as the student knowledge increases, you can use the second language for conversations, content and directions. As I said, bonjour, merci. As they start to learn the date in French, I start to use the date all the time in French versus in the beginning, I might say something was due in the English form of the date. Now I say something is due in the French form of the date because I know they know the date in French. That's one example. Also live class sessions in our organization, we offer live class sessions that students are required to attend. And as Taryn was touching on earlier with as much authentic realia, even from online sources as we can. Within the course content, we have some restraints, but in our live classes, we can bring in some real world um, information so that the students can really respond to and know that this language really exists outside the world and it will only help their assessment later. Best practice number three uh, that corresponds with challenge number three, assessments and connection with interaction. Poll and survey and chat and get to know your students to engage them more personally and once you know more about them personally then you can share authentic materials of their interests. If you know they love uh, bike riding or and, and then the tour, de, it happens to be the year the, the, uh, the Tour de France, it's in the summer session and the Tour de France is happening, make sure you make that a part of your lessons and your engagements with them so it still stays as meaningful with them as possible. It will only help them in their true assessments that they get for a grade. I know we don't like to talk about grades, but it's a part of life. Use language and cultural norms in your communication with them. Um, if someone tells me they've been sick, I wish them to feel better in French. Now I know they don't know what any of those words mean, but they get the hang of it. <laughs> and sometimes they put a little English or sometimes I franglais it, but they will, and, um, but these cultural norms of how to say bless you. If I'm on the phone with somebody and they sneeze, I say bless you in French um, as a means of these are cultural norms in the target language. They benefit from so much online media in the target language. We are actually, I wish I had had these online resources when I was in high school. Uh, learning a second language. Seize cultural and language opportunities in any of their communities. If you happen to be in the same community, share the information, encouraging to witness these things in person. You don't want them to just be a, um, a, 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 a passive participant of watching things go on in their community. Challenge them to see when they go, oh, there's a French play coming to my town. Challenge them to go see that French play. Uh, in our organization, we also have something called the Culture Cafe, and we include varying topics on this Culture Cafe. It's like a live class session. Um, it is uh, not typically taught in the target language because we have people from all over our institution come, and varying topics with varying languages, and then some on general topics like study abroad. Um, and these will only hone their skills more. Uh, they'll be able to self-assess them. They'll be able to use it in their e-portfolios, and it'll only help them more when they're being assessed for a grade. So best practice number four, assessments and assessments. You want to ensure the reliability and valid validity with backward design approach, as Taryn touched on, but that's a whole session on its own. <laughs> and use of rubrics, I can't stress that enough. Don't be afraid to modify as time goes on. So just because you've got your, your um, let's just use a standard old written test that's full of uh, different types of questions. 
don't be afraid to moderate it, uh, modify it as the years go on. What worked one year might not work the next year, or your goals might have changed, or your student needs might have changed. Don't be afraid to modify. Don't go, oh, I've made this test perfect. I'm going to keep it that way. No, you need to self-assess as a teacher as well. You need to look at the validity and the reliability of it for your students. Um, you need to make sure that if the wrong president is listed on the test, you need to change the president. Um, and then differentiate. Differentiation is really good when you have heritage learners in your class versus non-native speakers because uh, a heritage learner might not benefit from true, false, and fill in the blank. The heritage learner might need a little bit more um, a little bit more reason to communicate in the target language versus just that kind of assessment. Vary your types of questions. And does the question fit what you want the student to show at their level? So true, false can be great for culture, but so can short answer. Short answer can also be, tell me what you, you know, describe to scientists and tell me why they're important to the French society. Unfortunately, at the novice level, they're writing that in English, but by level three and by four, they're writing that in French. But it's okay if they start the material in English at the novice level because you want them to be where you want them to fit where they are. Vary your types of assessments and modes of submissions. Sometimes they, they submit a special submission folder. I put Dropbox to make it general. Um, sometimes it's a text. Everybody send me a text um, um, or uh, send me a text and, and, and it, it, that's, a, that's a short way of assessing students as well. Audio. Um, then the challenge before was, of course, the technology and the audio, but you overcome those by having a cheat sheet of audio options that students can use in order to record their voice. Discussions, projects, participation in an authentic forum as permitted. So depending on your institution, an idea that you could do would be um, go to this news website, it's something with cultural and current events, and, and you're specifically referring them to a specific article in French, like maybe La Rentrée, the going back to school for the French students. And you say, you know, read the article and then comment on, you know how at the end of news articles, people are commenting, and you say comment on the article and take a screenshot of it and send it to me. That's a great way of making something authentic, using realia, um, and it's a different form of participation in an assessment. Make it personal to them. Taryn touched on the e-portfolio options. E-lingual portfolio is a great start for students. For fluency-based assessments, I would prefer that it was more in French or the language that we were using, but I think it's a great tool, even in English, to get students to start thinking about how to make e-portfolios for when they go into the workforce. So they might not show their e-portfolio to their, the job they're interviewing for. They might eventually go up to a more advanced e-portfolio option, but they have started learning how to self-assess themselves and collect the evidence to show that. And Taryn made a great point. What a great thing to show an a, a prospective employer. Design and include group and pair work opportunity. We don't do this yet um, at my institution because we're working on other things right now and, and nobody can um, be perfect all the time. We always have to have goals to strive for. And one of them is I would love, I would love to just design and include at least one group or pair work opportunity, but there are limitations in the online assessment world or in the online classroom because of the distances um, because of FERPA laws, you don't always want students to be connecting and communicating too much because we work with various schools in various areas. We are not just, but if we were at one school in one town, I would probably definitely get, try to get a group or pair work together. Um, a way to group them up for you and under your, under your guidance would be a website called groupme.com, which is a way to get students connected on group texts that you are facilitating. And so as students um, send texts, to you to ask you questions, other students could answer them as well. Everybody's participating if they'd like to, and then you're monitoring that as well or answering as needed. So that is a way to group students together as well. The last one, best practices number five for assessments and feedback, use as much of that language, the second language as possible depending on the level, translate if you have to. As your vocabulary increases, keep adding more of the second language into the feedback. Crashen's theory of L plus one, at their level plus one more. So aside from, um, for French one, one of the things we do is we supply our students with a list of great job type things we're gonna say in French to them, and what does it mean? <laughs> so we give them, we give them, we kind of, I think uh, most of us have an announcement where you use, where we go, have you noticed I've been using these words in your feedback? Très bien, or bon travail, or bravo. These are what those words mean, or look at it one more time, or try again, or not bad, or good effort. Um, and we go over that with them from the start, and we start using those from the start. Now, depending on their level, our detailed and individual feedback to them might be in English for clarity. Um, 
But we also need to make sure that when we give that detailed feedback that we're telling them why. We're not just correcting some of their errors. We want them to improve. We want them to make strides to success. So we're going to tell them what needed to be different about it. And we can either do that by saying, um, we can ask them a question like, isn't there something else you need to have at this the end of the sentence? Go back to the lesson and then let me know. Or we remodel it for them, we recast it for them, and they say it should look like this. Um, so whatever the student's needs are, but we need to vary your feedback and it needs to be detailed in line with the rubric for which you provided for that assignment. Offer additional um, second language rich resources as needed for remedi remediation, as authentic as possible. And then vary your method offering feedback. One of the goals I have coming up soon is I want to do one live feedback session with a student. Um, one per semester is what I'm going to start with because of the number of students I have, but I would love to get them, I would be like, you know, choose your, um, or I'll choose an assignment probably to start off with, and I'd like to get on the phone with them and say, let's go over this assignment together. It gives them an opportunity to um, hear from you one-on-one -on, -one on what their needs are, and also to hear your tone of voice that you're there to support them. Um, other ways of offering feedback written, you could, you could record your voice and give audio feedback back. You could do a small video. Um, you can also offer a correction key to students. Like if I've underlined it, it means it's a grammar issue. If I put it in quotes, it means you misspelled it. Um, and you can offer that and sometimes grade from like a, a key code. You can also let students correct their own errors uh, to keep learning. Like, like I had said earlier, there's something missing from the sentence or take a look at that verb. Does it go with that subject? Write me back and let me know. Or um, I think, you know, sometimes I say, I think you learned how to say goodbye a little differently. Take a look back at the lesson and let me know what your choices are. And then also the fear, the peer feedback I'd love to eventually institute. So because of time, oh, five minutes over. Thank you for your passions. You've been very sweet to listen to me. Um, and these were my uh, experiences with you of the challenges, the top five challenges and the top five best practices I've used over the years in my online teaching. So thank you for this forum as well, uh, Stephen and Sarah, to be able to share this with other online teachers.